Well, thank you all for coming, and, and I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Nico Hatsopoulos from, from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Hatsopoulos is a professor in the Department of Organismal Biology and Anatomy. Uh, he also is chairman of the, of the Committee of Computational Neuroscience at the University of Chicago and has been the co-director for the Center for Integrative Neuroscience and Neuroengineering Research. He has over 75 publications. He's trained numerous uh, students and postdocs who have gone on to do great things, like become our grad students, so, right? Um, and he's going to give us a talk today on adaptation and learning uh, in a brain machine interface. <coughs> I should also mention that Dr. Atsopoulos has been very instrumental in, in uh, commercialization of neurotechnologies, uh, specifically development of a company called Cyberkinetics, which was the precursor to what we now know as our brain gate clinical trial. So we are, of course, personally very much indebted to him. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Atsopoulos. Well, thank you very much, Bolu, for, for the invitation. Um, I'm pleased to see so many people today. I, I didn't expect this. I thought because the university was closed, you, we'd have maybe four or five people, and we'd just go, go to a coffee shop and <laughs> I'd, I'd talk to you about it. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've never actually been to Cleveland before, um, and uh, but it doesn't really, the weather doesn't really bother me. I'm from Chicago, so it's pretty much the same. Um, I wanted to tell you uh, up front um, two things. First of all, that the work that I'm going to talk about is still in work in progress, so it's not a completed story, but I just thought I'd share some of the things we're doing. I. Um, I can continue, I'll, I'll talk about adaptation and learning a little bit, or for most of the talk. If we have time, I'll, uh, I'll, if we have the time, I'll talk about some work we did with uh, augmenting BMIs with proprioception at the end, if we, if we have time. The other thing is my department uh, and committees, these are weird terms. So the, my department, first of all, has this strange name. And in fact, my chair received a letter from uh, a woman who had some intimacy problems and wanted some help and uh, and, and, and so we, we told her that in fact we couldn't help her uh, but uh, so we decided actually we're going to change this name it's going to become Department of Integrative Biology just it's just a mouthful the other thing is these committees which is sounds like remnants from the Soviet Union uh, these are actually graduate programs, and so we have a graduate program in computational neuroscience and a separate one in neurobiology. Okay, and please interrupt me uh, throughout the talk if you have questions. I, I, I really welcome questions. So I've been working um, since the mid-90s on uh, um, cortically controlled brain machine interfaces, and I really have, as many of you know, uh, probably know they have these components. I break them up into these four components, uh, an array of uh, sensors that pick up electrical signals, in our case, uh, action potentials from individual neurons in the motor cortex. And by the way, all this work is, uh, that I'm going to be talk about, is talking about is with non-human primates. So, um, so we pick up these signals with a sensor array. Uh, we then decode the, the signals into some useful output variable which then is led to an output device. And then, of course, it gets, uh, we, we, something that we've just recently begun to look at is the role of sensory feedback in guiding this, these movements. Um, as, a, as a neuroscientist, uh, I, I'm not an engineer, so I don't really focus much on this. I mean, I basically buy these things. Uh, I also don't spend too much time on the output device because, um, again, I'm not an engineer. So I'm mostly focusing on the decoding algorithm and the role of sensory feedback. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, <clears throat> how we can either adapt the decoding algorithm to improve performance uh, using adaptive algorithms, and at the same time looking at neural plasticity that, that naturally occurs while an animal is engaged in the long-term long -term exposure of a brain-machine interface. So as far as, uh, before I begin, let me just tell you that I'm using these, um, these BlackRock or Utah arrays that were originally developed, developed by or invented by Dick Norman at the University of Utah. And these are silicon arrays composed of 100 electrodes arranged in a 10 by 10 grid. Uh, 
Uh, they, that's my fingertip to give you a sense of the scale. Uh, each electrode is separated by its neighbors by 400 microns, and it's the tips of these electrodes that are, uh, are metallized, either with platinum or uh, um, iridium oxide. And uh, it's these tips that are picking, picking up extracellular uh, potentials, either local field potentials or action potentials from individual neurons. Um, and this is a monkey brain right here, the central sulcus. We typically implant in the primary motor cortex of the arm area. We're also, we've also done implants in the dorsal premotor cortex and the ventral premotor cortex and, and, in a project looking at the coordination, the, the neural basis of the coordination of reach and grasp, uh, which I won't talk about today. So today we're going to mainly focus on recordings in the primary motor cortex. So for the decoding adaptation part of the talk, uh, we restricted ourselves to a, a, a relatively simple behavioral paradigm where uh, a monkey is trained to first uh, perform a task with their intact arms um, by moving a cursor in two dimensions. So they're, they're holding onto this handle which is attached to an exoskeletal robot uh, and in, basically it's, it's just a glorified joystick that they have to move to move a cursor that's presented on the screen. Um, and so it's limited to two-dimensional movements. And, 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 and the task basically is to hit the, blue t hit the blue target. As soon as you hit the blue target, the target jumps to another random location, and then the monkey has to move there. And then after he's performed X number of hits, target hits, he gets rewarded and then a new set of sequence, a new sequence of random position targets appears. So over the course of a whole session, which might last an hour and a half or something, you're getting you know, many, many, many different movements, a rich variety of horizontal movements, but with different directions, different speeds, and different amplitudes. So, uh, to de so in this context of a very, limited behavioral tasks, we, we developed uh, decoding algorithms to try to predict and, and do it in real time in closed loop fashion so that the monkey now is controlling the cursor with his brain instead of with his arm. And traditionally, most people have uh, focused on, including our, ourselves, on kinematic decoders where you have populations of cells in the motor cortex which decode some kinematic variable, whether it's the joint angle theta, the joint velocity, the endpoint position or velocity, um, and that gets then sent to a virtual object, in, case, in our case a cursor, which has no mass and, and basically is moved according to these uh, commands. Uh, as soon as you have now a physical system, of course, you've got, you've got to do something with that and you can, the standard approach is to take these kinematic variables and send them through a, a PD controller, which in turn generates forces or torques acting on a physical plant. Um, and that's uh, something we've also been do doing where we simulated the uh, dynamics of the monkey's arm as well as the exoskeletal robot on which his arm is resting. So in these uh, results I'm going to show you, we're actually going to be simulating the dynamics of the arm and, 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 the, and the robot. And he's going to be controlling uh, the endpoint of this simulated dynamical system uh, he's going to control it either by using kinematic variables or alternatively decoding kinetics. So that's an alternative approach where you now directly map uh, neural activity to kinetic variables such as forces or torques which directly act on the plant. Um, and it's, it's inter interesting historically that people have relied mainly on this approach on kinematic decoding because if you go back to the er the mid to late 60s when Ed Evarts did his you know, seminal work looking at the encoding properties of primary motor cortical cells, he first documented the idea that these uh, cells really cared, cared about kinetic variables, forces or uh, changes in forces. Uh, and that was sort of the, uh, sort of the, 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 in, the initial establishment of what these cells really care about. That was sort of abandoned later on 
and people started focusing more on kin kin kinematic variables. And, and now, of course, it, I think uh, the trends have gone back to more uh, kinetic decoding and, of course, muscle decoding more directly. Um, and I know you guys are very much interested in direct muscle decoding. So if you look at, um, we, we, we've shown that you can uh, decode, um, like many others have shown, that you can decode kinetic, uh, kinematic variables, such as position here. So this is, uh, again, the monkey performing this random, uh, uh, ra random target task uh, with his arm. And, and we can offline predict the actual motion of the, of the hand quite well, as many other people have shown. But we can also decode the, uh, the torques of the shoulder and elbow that we estimate based on the, 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 the equations of motion of the arm and the, and the robot. And so we can actually do a pretty good job of decoding these kinetic variables as well from the same cells in primary motor cortex. Um, so if you have compare now across multiple monkeys, so this is now uh, two data sets from each of three monkeys, uh, and, and you just do offline decoding, we can account for a um, you know, variable degree, a fraction of variance. Um, but you can see the point here is that you can decode position in, with a square, uh, mark the circle is velocity decoding, and the uh, diamond is torque decoding. And torque decoding does reasonably well, comparable to what we can do with just position and velocity, except for perhaps this data set right here, where it's, torque decoding is, is uh, significantly weaker than position or velocity. So, so we argue that perhaps we could, uh, since we know we can decode both kinematic variables and kinetic variables, perhaps we could create a hybrid system that decodes both. And this is work that actually one of your students, Frank Willett, participated in together with Andy Fagg at the University of Oklahoma, uh, Aaron Siminski, my postdoc, who's now at, in Milwaukee School of Engineering, and Matt Bodenhammer, who's a student or postdoc of Andy Fagg's. So the idea is we have now a hybrid system where we have cells from motor cortex that sent, are, gets, are sent through two decoders, a position decoder that decodes position of the endpoint um, <clears throat> of the simulated dynamical system, and a separate decoder that decodes torques of the shoulder and elbow. This position decoder then it gets, sends, it gets sent through a PD controller, which tries to move the arm in order to minimize that error. Uh, and at the same time, we have this direct feed forward command from the torque decoder which gets added up together with the PD controller. And, and, that, and together, they all act on the simulated arm and robot. So the, the total torque now is the torque coming from the feed forward command from the torque decoder plus the PD position derivative, uh, proportional derivative uh, controller from the, from the uh, position decoder. So, how do, we, how do we initialize these decoders? So how do we actually build these decoders? Now, traditionally, people with uh, researchers that use intact animals can actually have the animals perform the task with their intact arms. We, that then gives them both neural activity as well as motion from which they can then build a mapping. Uh, what we wanted to try to do instead was try to simulate a, a more clinically relevant uh, situation where the animal couldn't move. Um, and um, so what we did instead was we, we trained the animals not to move at all. So they're, uh, they're sitting still. Their arm is uh, grabbing the end of that exoskeletal robot. But what they're given is visual feedback of the task they just performed. So this is a case where they're actually moving their arm to move the cursor in the random target pursuit task. In this case, they're trained not to move their arm and just shown visual playback. And of course, and, and what was striking to us, this is now years ago, and now, uh, but it was still quite surprising to us, is that cells in the primary motor cortex show, at least some of them, show remarkable mirror-like responses, both when that match uh, the, the, the properties of many of these cells, uh, 
respond almost identically when the monkey watches the task versus when they perform the task. So these are examples, three peri-event histograms from three different motor cortical cells. Um, this cell right here is sort of what, what we expected to see uh, where <coughs> uh, we're aligning this data, by the way, at, the, at uh, the onset of a new target presentation and the random target uh, task. So at zero, a new target appears, and the monkey has to now make a new movement to that new target. And what we expected to see in most of these cells was almost no, no response during observation and this ramping up of a response while the, in the case when the monkey was actually moving the, moving the uh, joystick with his arm. Uh, but in fact, what we saw in many cases were examples like this and this where the responses were nearly identical during observation versus action. So, and now this is now a standard thing. Uh, you guys uh, with your brain gate trial are using the same thing with human patients. Um, but it's still, at the time, it really struck us as quite remarkable uh, that this could happen. So we have these animals trained to not move. They're watching the visual playback of, of the tasks that they had just performed, build the decoders based on that, uh, on the, uh, the motion of the cursor and mapping and creating a mapping between the neural activity that's elicited by the observation, map that onto the motion of the cursor. So having initialized these decoders, we do this both for position and torque. The question is, can we now develop an algorithm that adapts to um, changes in the dynamics of the system? And so we, uh, we and we is primarily Andy Fagg who first came up with the idea that was uh, motivated by work by Kawato and Gomi in the early 90s. The idea is that we, <clears throat> we have the, an error that's created by the, um, the, the difference between the output of the, um, the actual motion of the arm and the, um, and, and the, and the error that, I'm sorry, the error between the, the, the actual position and what we, want, what we commanded from the PD controller. So the PD controller creates an, a natural error that we can use not only to correct the motion of the robot arm, but also provide an error term to adapt the coefficients of the torque decoder. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. The idea is error from the PD controller not only corrects at the moment, the, the motion of the arm, but also provides an error term to adapt the coefficients of the torque decoder or the feed forward command. So we need to come up with a cost function. And the cost function is basically uh, reflects the, the difference between where we are and where we want to be. And that we considered to be the, um, the difference between the torque decoder output and the, and the correct torque, which we don't know what it is. Um, so the torque decoder output is basically F, which is the, the response of a group of neurons that are fed through a simple linear uh, weighting, basically a, a Wiener filter, W. This represents the output of the torque decoder. We have some unknown uh, correct torque that reflects the error at, time, at, at some particular time. The total error that we're trying to minimize is we consider to be not only due to the current error, but also the error in the <coughs> recent past. And we weight the recent past with this weighting function, rho. So errors in the immediate present are weighted heavily. Errors in the distant past are weighted less. So we're trying to minimize this total error function right here. If we now use gradient descent and we assume, and this is basically the uh, feedback error learning assumption, if we assume, uh, now we take the derivative. Now this term right here, that is the output of the torque decoder and the unknown correct torque is approximately equal to the, the torque generated by the PD controller. So we make that assumption, it's approximately equal. If that's the case, we then have a, a very straightforward update rule 
to adjust the weights of the torque decoder based on the error created by the PD torque and weighted by this weighting function and the firing rates of the cells. So using this error term, we did a couple of experiments. In, uh, we, did, we did offline experiments or simulated experiments, but then we actually uh, gave this to the animal and, uh, and, and perturbed the system in, in two different ways. In the first way, we just corrupted the decoder, um, the torque decoder completely. Uh, so he's go moving around, he's, he's, he's controlling the, the device with his decoder. He's hitting targets like this. this. So these marks right here represent hits. At some point, we corrupt the torque decoder's weights. We just add noise to them. And his performance basically collapses. So his hit rate goes to zero. He, in fact, he hits no targets within the prescribed time. So he has a certain time limit that he has to hit a target. And of course, he gets frustrated here because he's like, I, wanna, I want my juice. Uh, I can't get my juice. Uh, we then put trigger learning, turn on the FEL learning, and very quickly, uh, in a matter of you know, a few seconds, the weights to the torque decoder get, get adjusted and he can start uh, beginning, he can resume hitting the targets. So you can see we, we use two different measures, the time to, uh, time to target, TTT, which is the time it took him to hit the targets. Basically, here we get uh, this value here, the blue bar represents pre-corruption. During corruption, he basically performs he doesn't perform at all, so we're not even plotting that because so basically his time to target is infinity. Uh, then we turn on the, uh, the, the FEL learning, and early in learning, we see a, an increase in time to target, uh, but then gradually goes back to baseline. And then at and the red point, we, we actually turn off FEL, and it remains stable. The coefficients remain stable. Uh, this is, just shows you another, basically the same same thing, but now looking at the path length. So ideally, what he wants to do is make a nice straight line movement to the target. Um, and any deviation from a straight line will create a path length that's greater than one. So if, if a path length is perfectly straight, it'll be a, uh, it's basically a ratio measure between the actual path length divided by a perfectly straight path length. So. So he, he, he actually never generates perfectly straight path lengths, uh, even prior to corruption. But then we corrupt the decoder. Of course, he doesn't do anything. We then turn on FEL. His path length is still relatively large, but then it goes down. And then we turn off FEL, and it, and it stays relatively stable after the fact, although there is some learning effects we're seeing here and here. But basically, the path length increases. Uh, when we corrupt the decoder and turn on FEL, and it gradually it, it goes back to baseline. Another perturbation we did, which is something you might experience on a day-to-day -day basis, is imagine you know you're moving around. All of a sudden, you want to pick up your suitcase, uh, and you're traveling somewhere. The mass of your limb, of course, has changed immediately, very quickly. You now have to control the mass of your limb. Uh, with a much different, much larger mass. So we try to simulate that by, uh, again, in simulation, adding a five kilogram mass to the end of the simulated uh, arm. So uh, just let's skip this right here. Let's just go straight to the results. The time to target prior to the mass introduction um, is about one. This is actually normalized. So it's normalized to the the time to target prior to uh, the introduction of mass. So by definition, this is one. We then <clears throat> add the five kilogram mass. The time to target jumps way up. At this point here, now we turn on FEL, FEL learning. It still remains pretty, pretty high, but very quickly, it comes back down to baseline. Same is true for path length and speed as well. So. Early on, after you add the mass, the path length shoots up. Early in FEL learning, it's still pretty high, and then it comes back down to baseline. 
So this FEL algorithm is, is a way to sort of deal with very sudden changes in the system. Uh, yeah? Could you give us a feel for the time? Do you have a number of movements? Yes. Oh, what, what's the time scale of this? So this is, uh, this is minutes, basically. I mean, so, I mean, he's generating, when we say movements, what we mean is individual target hits. And each target hit might be something like, um, I don't know, uh, anywhere from a, a fraction of a second to, to several seconds. So yeah, this whole thing is happening in, in basically minutes. And this adaptation, the FEL adaptation is happening very quickly. If you go back to, I think it's shown here. Well, this shows time right here. So, you know, basically we turn on FEL right here in a matter of seconds, uh, performance shoots way back up. So it's a way to very quickly adapt to changing dynamical context. Okay, so that's, um, so that's adaptation on the decoder side. Something we've just, uh, we've been working on for the past few years is adaptation on the, on the monkey side. Um, and, um, so in this approach, what we're doing is we're going to use a fixed, completely fixed decoder. Uh, nothing changes over months. The only thing that might change is the, the neurons that are participating in the decoder may change. But other than that, the, de the decoding coefficients are not changed at all. And we're going to rely on the monkey to learn to adapt. Uh, and this is a project that uh, Karth uh, is spearheading a postdoc in my lab, together with Kareem, Andy, Mukta Vedia is a graduate student in my lab, and Josh Sutherland was a, uh, worked with Andy Fag. And in this project, what we did was, this was uh, sponsored by DARPA, and DARPA was interested in uh, you know, soldiers with uh, amputations coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. So we got a hold of um, some non-human primates that had undergone therapeutic amputation. Um, so these were, uh, amputees that were at least 10 years on, so chronic amputees. Um, we had three, we, our vets basically started making calls to vendors and found, found the, because they get, they get into fights and they get injured, and to rescue them, um, they have to amputate. And in fact, all three of our monkeys were females because basically the vendors uh, are, are kind of motivated to save the females. Uh, for breeding purposes, and uh, and so they're saved, they're rescued, and then we got a hold of them ten years after the amputation. Uh, two of them had amputations at the basically at the elbow, and one at the at the wrist. <clears throat> and what they're what we're what we're proposing to do was to have them control this uh, uh, Barrett arm and hand using signals from the motor cortex contralateral to the amputation. And so we, we decided, because we, we can't use biomimetic decoding, that is, we don't have actual motion of the arm because there's no arm anymore, we have to rely on some other approach to build the decoding algorithm in the first place. We could, we could have used observation data. Uh, and in fact, we did try that. We actually showed the mo monkey this Barrett arm and hand moving in space and tried to elicit motor cortical activity. It, it didn't really work that well. It's kind of a foreign body to him. It's not something that he's accustomed to. You know, perhaps if we had sort of dressed it up uh, with fur or something, it may have elicited some natural uh, motor cortical activity, but basically we didn't do that. So instead we relied on another approach to initialize, uh, to initialize the decoder. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But we wanted to rely primarily on operant conditioning and feedback and biofeedback. So this is an old idea that Ev Fetz proposed in the late 60s uh, when he recorded from individual neurons and motor cortex. He fed the output of the, f of the response of these neurons to a, to a little dial that the monkey could see. And he trained using the, the, the visual feedback of the firing rate of the cell Together with reward, he could train these monkeys to modulate individual cells in the motor cortex. 
So we're doing this, uh, basically building on that idea, but now looking at modifying many, many cells. So, so how do we build a decoder? Well, we, we, we basically created an, a, a, an arbitrary mapping between populations of cells and outputs. Uh, but, this, but it wasn't completely arbitrary. So it was an unsupervised linear decoder, so a straightforward Wiener filter decoder, but it had to satisfy certain constraints. It generated a velocity output, but it, and that velocity output had to be smooth in time. It had to be zero mean. So, and this was measured during spontaneous activity. So the monkey's just sitting there, not doing anything. We're recording from motor cortical activity, contralateral to the amputation. We create a, a set of filter coefficients such that the output of the, of the decoder is zero mean Gauss, with Gaussian output. Um, and the other constraint is that different neurons, um, we, we didn't want only one or a few cells to participate in the decoding. So we wanted to sh share the labor across neurons. So we didn't want a situation where the weights associated with one neuron were dominant and all the other ones were weak. So we, we applied uh, a cost function to try to share the labor across many neurons. So using these constraints, we essentially created an arbitrary mapping uh, between the neural activity and the velocity output. Now that velocity output was then sent to the robot. But the way we did it was, uh, for BMI control, what we, what we did was, instead of taking the entire population of cells we recorded from, which in, our, uh, in the first two monkeys at least, it was something on the order of about 160 units. What we did instead, you know, we, we created clusters of units. And we assigned clusters of units to each degree of freedom of the robot. So, the, so we assigned uh, one cluster right here uh, to just move the ar robot arm forward and back. So he just had to reach. We assigned another cluster of units uh, to open and close the grasp. And then finally, in, later on, which I'm not going to show you the results from, a third cluster resulted in reaching left and right. And these clusters were typically somewhere between 10 and 20 units per cluster. So now we have, you know, if we're only looking at two degrees of freedom, that might be something like, you know, 20 to 30 units. We now have a whole additional reservoir of units that we're not using. And that's something we want to look at. Uh, you know, I know Jose Carmenez looked at what, what happens during long-term exposure to these cells that are not participating in the decoding, something we want to study as well. But the other reason we have this reservoir is that if, for example, if by accident we lose a cell in that cluster, we can now replace it with one of the cells in the, in the reservoir. Uh, the other thing we did was the to define the units that belong to a cluster, we, we actually looked at the, um, using just basically correlational measures, looked at the, uh, the, the similarity and responses between cells, or the covariance between the cells. And we, we wanted to populate clusters that had similar properties uh, in terms of their, their sort of covariance during spontaneous activity. Um, so, so these are now sort of functionally connected or correlated cells within a given cluster. Um, they're also relatively stable. Now, how, stable meaning they're the, they don't, they're, they're less likely to be lost over time. How do we do that? Well, we've documented with these Utah arrays that if you record cells day in and day out, if you find a cell and using either the, the waveform or the inner spike interval histogram as a measure of, of identity, that if the same cell is seen over seven days successively, then it's very likely to be seen on the eighth day. So we, prior to doing these experiments, we tracked the stability of these cells. And, only, and so we had a stability measure associated with each unit 
So if we had seen this unit t day in and day out for seven days, that was a highly stable unit. We, we put that into these clusters. So these were highly stable units. Um, and in fact, we didn't actually, in, in some of the results I'm going to show you, over the course of three months, we didn't actually have to replace any of the units. We now, we're not 100% sure they were the same units over time. We didn't verify that, but we didn't ever have to, we never lost the cell. Okay, so here's, so what's, what's the, the task of the monkey? The task of the monkey is to reach out, grab a ball, grasp it, pull it back, and then release. And then he'd get rewarded. So this is the task. And this is during brain control using just two clusters, one to reach forward and back, and the other one to grasp, whole hand grasp. And this is, again, with uh, populations of neurons contralateral to the amputation. He gets rewarded when he, he releases. He has to pull back and release. Yeah. So it's not enough to just touch the object. He has to grab it, pull it back. And there are sensors on this robot that tell us when he's made contact with the object. Um, OK. So we were interested in learning during long-term exposure. And it's, um, originally, our intent was to actually expose these animals to this task for very long periods of time, even in their cages, by using a wireless system. We never, we never got to that because DARPA cut our funding. But, uh, but basically, we tried to give them as much exposure in the experimental rig as possible. And what's plotted here is um, the, the time to target that is the time to successfully perform the task as a function of the effective training time. And this is plotted in the log-log units because this is something that um, uh, this, this linear relationship in log-log units where the time to perform a task decreases as a function of time engaged in the task is something you see very, uh, com it's a very common feature of motor skill acquisition. So I don't know, you've probably, I mean, there's some old studies that have looked at a variety of different tasks. And, and you basically see this kind of linear relationship with many, many repeats of the same task. Uh, the, the classic example is cigar rolling. So you basically, cigar rollers get better and better at the task, even, at, even over a million cigar rolls. So I mean, it's a very slow process, but it does show improvement. And each of these colors represent two monkeys that engaged in this task. So they, you know, in this graph, we're, we're showing about 1,000 minutes of data. Um, they've actually gone for more than that. They've gone for about two to 3,000 minutes of, of training, continuous training. Uh, and this, this data gets even better. <clears throat> OK, so but what, what, what I was really interested in, besides the fact that learning occurs, um, is other features of behavioral learning, but also neural plasticity. Uh, what's happening to the neurons? Um, and one thing we, we decided to look at is uh, this idea of functional connectivity or effective connectivity. That is, do we see uh, changes in uh, how cells are connected to one another in a, in a, in a functional sense, not in an anatomical sense? It's, we can't measure that. And, uh, and, and what, what happens to the connectivity within a cluster and across cl clusters? So the way that we did this was using basically a, 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 an adaptation of Granger causality. So the idea is we have a bunch of neurons, x1 to xn, and we're trying to predict the response of each of these neurons at time t, either based on the past history of that neuron or based on the past history of other neurons. OK, so this, this is X1 neuron. We're trying to predict its responses based on sort of an autoregressive model based on its past history. 
but now we want to include the past history of, uh, of oh, this is mislabeled, this should be X2, the past history of neuron 2 on predicting the future of X1. And likewise for Xn, can we predict, based on the past of Xn, can we predict the present of X1? And, and so the idea is, very simply, we build a model, a complete model, regressive model that includes all these terms, all these past terms, and then we remove, so we're trying to predict X1, and then we remove X2 from the model, and then we look at its uh, predictive capacity. In, in predicting X1. If we see a significant decrease in predictive power, we, we then argue that, in fact, X2, uh, there's an effective connection between X2 and X1, okay? That it, 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 it provides predictive uh, power on the, on the response of X1. So, so this is the model, basically. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a straightforward linear model, but a generalized linear model where we're trying to predict the log response of a neuron lambda, that is the firing rate of neuron I, lambda, based on a baseline response. And the responses of, of either itself or other neurons in the population. So R is the response of neuron N in the population. And, and the idea is if we, can, uh, if we can predict better when we include a, a, another neuron in the model, then there's an effective connection. So we actually create, so it's basically Granger causality between neurons, but we use lo the log likelihood ratio test. So we're, sa we're trying to estimate the present response of neuron I based on the past responses of all other neurons except neuron J. And we look at that probability versus the probability of the response of neuron I with all the neurons. If that ratio is not one and significantly different than one, then we, we then sp speculate or stipulate that there's a, an effective connection between neuron J and neuron I. Okay, so we use that approach and we, there's, a, you know, there's a statistical test one, one can use to assess that. Uh, we now have, <clears throat> this is on day one of the exposure to the BMI. We have a reach cluster of neurons. So these are all the neurons participating in the, just reaching forward and back. And this is the grass cluster. All the neurons evolving and opening, closing the neuron, uh, the, the, the hand. <clears throat> and these are the connecti connections we found, both within the clusters and across the clusters. And you can't, see, there are no arrows here, but they're, they're, they're actually directed connections. Okay, so we have a way to, because it, it's, it, it's giving us directional information. <clears throat> so what happens over time? So this is over 37 days of exposure, um, 37 training sessions that span about three months of training, uh, real time. Uh, <clears throat> and what's plotted here is the number of significant connections emanating from a given neuron. So these, the x-axis represents a particular neuron in one of the two clusters. The bar represents the number of significant connections that are emanating from it. So it's the out degree, the uh, number of connections emanating from that neuron to other neurons, okay? And so you can see right here uh, these are all the neurons in both, in both the reach cluster and the grass cl uh, cluster. You see a certain number of connections. That starts to increase over time, and by day 37, it's actually uh, significantly larger than it was on day one. <clears throat> There's also, and, and what we're plotting here is both the number of excitatory connections and the number of inhibitory connections. So the green is excitatory connections and the gray are inhibitory connections. The way we assess that is by just looking at the coefficients of the history terms uh, and just take the, the mean sign of those coefficients. And, and by the way, the, the history terms that we use were, we went back 60 um, milliseconds in the past, okay? 
So we see a significant increase in excitatory and inhibitory connections with training. Now if we look more carefully at connections either within clusters or across clusters, we see this right here. So this is now, the, the orange is now excitatory connections within the reach uh, cluster and we see uh, a significant increase, that's summarized here, a significant increase in the number of excitatory connections within, within the reach cluster. On the other hand, in the grass cluster, we see a, a relatively stable number of connections that doesn't change over time. Now, if you now look at connections between clusters, that is connections from the reach cluster to the grass cluster or vice versa, um, <clears throat> we see this. So what's striking here to me is we do see a slight increase in uh, in, uh, increase in excitatory connections, but we see this dramatic increase in inhibitory connections between clusters. So what's happening here, we, we, uh, at least what we think is happening, is this, the cells within the cluster are becoming much more tightly correlated and functionally connected. They're actually becoming decorrelated across the clusters. Now this is total number of connections, so I'm just showing you here the y-axis is the total number of connections emanating from a given neuron. This is now normalized by the total number of possible connections. Um, so one would be that it would be a fully connected network. So you can see about 50% of the total number of connections, um, somewhere between 50 to 70% of the total number of connections are significant. If you look within the clusters, the reason the grass cluster doesn't change it's because it's basically saturated. It's almost fully connected on day one for some reason. We don't really know why. And there's really no room for it to grow. So it, it, it just, no more connections can be formed. Okay, so I don't know what time we got, 9.20 here? Okay. I'm sorry? 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, okay. Um, so, so I've shown you two examples of adapt adaptation. I've shown you this sort of fast adaptation that it can occur on the algorithmic level when the dynamics of the system change uh, using FEL feedback error learning. And I showed you a, a situation where we modeled, uh, a we use a hybrid system from the same population of M1 neurons. But what I want to do ultimately is use this FEL system where we have distinct populations of cells for the kinematic decoder versus the kinetic decoder. For example, in motor cortex, we know that cells on the rostral uh, gyrus of the motor cortex tend to carry more kinetic information versus cells deep within the central sulcus, which are more uh, uh, related to the kinetics of, 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 of the output. We know, for example, from Peter Strick's work that all the uh, cortical motor neuronal cells that make direct connections with motor neurons are sitting within the central, uh, within the bank of the central sulcus. So you can now use distinct populations for, e for either the kinetic or the kinematic. Alternatively, you could use a different cortical area altogether for the kinematic, for example, parietal cortex uh, area five or PRR uh, for the kinematic <coughs> decoder and use motor cortex for the kinetic decoder and use, in other words, use the parietal cortex to teach the motor cortex decoder how to change. So that, so that FEL algorithm works on, on the quick time scale. We now saw this very slow, much slower adaptation on the monkey. And what we want to ultimately do is integrate both in the same system. So we have a fast system for very sudden changes in dynamics. Uh, and then it's a slower system as motor skill adapts, uh, motor skill evolves. Since I have a few more minutes uh, before finishing up, I thought I'd talk about another project we're looking at, which is how to augment a brain-machine interface with proprioception. Um, and so, you know, this is a project, part of a larger project where we ultimately want to stimulate somatosensory cortex to pro provide artificial feedback to the animal about the motion and position of the limb in space. But towards that goal, we thought, well, what happens, perhaps we can um, uh, provide more naturalistic feedback by using 
the monkey's own arm as an afferent channel. So the idea is we, we know in many clinical situations, um, certainly with ALS, and maybe even in some cases uh, with uh, spinal cord injury, where you have a, a very debilitating loss in efferent control that you basically can't move the limb, you still have sensory feedback. So the idea is could we use that residual sensory feedback to inform the decoder and provide better control? So here's, the, here's what we did with our monkeys. <clears throat> we had a, an array in motor cortex that was sent through a real-time decoder <clears throat> that controlled the position of a cursor. And he was doing this random target pursuit task by controlling the, the cursor with his brain. <clears throat> but at the same time, we sent that decoder to the robot controller of the exoskeleton to passively move his arm. And so the question was, if we passively move the monkey's arm to follow the cursor, could we get better control of the cursor versus a situation where uh, the arm was at rest or the arm was moved in a completely random fashion, uncorrelated with the motion of the cursor? <clears throat> so what we did here was we first built the decoder, and we used visual playback. So now we show the monkey a video game of, that he had just performed. He's watching that. He's, he's not allowed to move his arm. We build the decoder that way. Then we now give the decoder to the animal under three different conditions. In the first condition, he's moving the cursor, um, <clears throat> and, but he's uh, not moving his arm at all. So, by the way, he never sees his arm in these experiments. All he sees is a cursor. His arm is sitting underneath the screen. So the, the arm is invisible or not visible to him. And moreover, where his arm is in space is totally irrelevant for getting the, performing the task and in terms of receiving reward. What's important is moving the cursor to the target. So in this case, his, he's trained not to move his arm at all. Sorry. <clears throat> and control the cursor with brain control. In the second condition, we have the robot, exoskeletal robot, moving his arm to follow the, to follow the cursor. But again, he's just, his brain is only controlling the motion of the cursor, not, not controlling his arm, just only indirectly moving his arm. And the final condition is called vision plus noisy RTD, where now he's moving the cursor with his brain, but the controller is, uh, the robot exoskeleton is moving his arm in a completely random fashion. And, and his arm is, uh, is actually attached to his body. It's just. Uh, <laughs> so how are you verifying that he's not actually generating internal torque? Ah, yes, right. So. Right, so he is trying, very often he tries to fight the robot. So we did two things. One thing was we, um, because the, the, ex, uh, the, 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 the PD controller that we used to control the robot was relatively compliant, we could, we could actually detect periods of time when he was fighting. And we actually took out, removed data when he was deviating from the commanded signal, when the, basically when the PD errors were large. The second thing we did and, um, was we <clears throat> did an experiment that kind of worked where we used Botox injections and injected the muscles of the, uh, fore of the elbow and shoulder. Uh, and, um, and that was a temporary block, a muscle block that lasted for about six weeks. We got some weakness, not complete weakness. I mean, it was, so in fact, he, ha he couldn't lift his arm against gravity, uh, but once he put his arm in the exoskeleton, he had enough force still that he could still move the, the robot, so it was not perfect. We'd like, actually like to go back and do this again, maybe with more Botox. Um, we're also proposing to do something else, which is doing the same approach, but with the hand instead. Uh, we're doing this now together with uh, Derek Camper at um, IIT where he's developing a, a hand exoskeleton 
um, and we're going to control it with the brain and then use Botox to paralyze the muscles of the, of the hand and that might work a little better. Um, so, he, so those are the conditions. Visual RTD with no arm movement, vision plus proprioception where the arm is passively moving to follow the cursor and vision plus noisy RTD where the arm is moving in a random fashion compared to the cursor. And to make a long story short, the results are shown here based on three different measures. If you look at the normalized time to target, this is during active movement when he's just, he's moving, this is before B, uh, brain machine control, he's just moving the arm, moving the robot to, uh, to hit the targets. He gets relatively low time to targets. This is now BMI control, brain control, with just vision only. He's only, he's moving the cursor, but his arm isn't moving at all. It shoots way up. Then it comes back down when his arm is moving, passively being moved to follow the cursor. And then the gray is the noisy condition where the arm is now not moving in a completely random fashion compared to <coughs> the motion of the cursor. And that was true for both monkeys. We saw this substantial improvement in time to target, also in path length, uh, and uh, also in the number of reversals. But I won't go into that. But so that's, so that's kind of exciting, the idea that you can actually use a, a wearable robot in, in many, perhaps in a subset of patients that have some residual feedback and use that residual feedback to inform the BMI. And as I said, we're using this um, with, uh, we're now trying to apply the same approach to the hand as well. So we're developing this uh, or adapting this hand exoskeleton that's being used uh, by Derek Camper to treat uh, stroke patients and adapt it to the monkey uh, without the monkey destroying it and, um, and then ultimately uh, control it with the brain and then inject uh, Botox in the hand muscles to paralyze the hand. So I think I'll stop there. I wanted to just thank Frank, who's here in the audience, and others in my lab, particularly um, Aaron Siminski, Karthikian, Balasubramanian, and, um, and then um, also uh, Taka Takahashi. Thank you very much. That's actually something we've, we're proposing to do. We haven't done it, but we compare the two approaches. The reason we, the original reason for doing the clustering approach was to, uh, to provide a, an easier way to train the animal. So what we did was we said, okay, let's assign a certain cluster of units to do the reach. The grass was controlled by the robot. He didn't have to worry about the grass. So he just had to focus on modulate my cells to, to move the arm forward, to grab the ball. As soon as I get close to it, the robot controller itself will do the grasp. Then, so once he's, he had accomplished that, we then added the grasp control. And we, our reasoning was, well, if we, have, if we have a separate population of neurons, it might not confuse the animal. If we use the same population of cells to add grasp, that would perturb the reach control. So we wanted to sort of unaffect the reach control, just tack on the grasp control. But that's something, yeah, we'd, we'd love to look at that. Uh, what, what would you expect in terms, of, in terms of learning? Is that your question? Yeah. In terms of performance, as well as learning, how, how quickly you could learn. Yeah, I, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. So after 
Yes. So we use, well, we use landmarks and we also stimulated in, in the OR. And what we got, um, we, we identified, so what, what you find, at least from what I, my reading of the literature, is following amputation in motor cortex, you basically, what used to control the hand that's gone is now controlling the stump. So in fact, when we stimulated, we saw stump movements uh, regard, in, regardless of where we were in the arm hand area. <laughs> Uh, so we targeted, I mean, that array doesn't span the entire arm area. So we, we actually, uh, we're targeting more of the arm area, um, more, in other words, slightly more medial than the hand area. But that's where we targeted. But we did do stimulation in the OR and we got, we got stump movements. Yeah. So <clears throat> going back to your breast cluster yeah. saturated, yeah. what are the chances that perhaps that cluster is bigger than you're recording from? And how do you how would you know that? How would you exploit that? Uh, bigger than I well, th those are the only cells that are engaged in the in the control of the robot of the of the of the grasp. There are no other neurons that are engaging in that task. Now there might be, there may be other cells that in, an, in, the, na in the intact limb might be involved in grasp. Is, is that your question? Yeah. Well, yeah. Sort of. yeah. 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 So yeah, so you know, so the question is, well, how do we, do we look at the, uh, do we look at the topography of, of the cells and, and use the topography to, to assign cells to either grasp or we, we looked at that, we didn't really, I mean, so one idea was we said, okay, we'll, we'll take all the medial sites and, and assign those to the reach cluster and you know, assign only lateral sites to the grass cluster. We didn't do that, but we thought about it. But, but you're right, I mean, there could be other cells that are naturally engaging, are, are normally engaged in a natural grass, which we didn't include in the grass cluster. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, have you have you tried uh, to plant on the ipsilateral side? Have you looked? We did. We did. We did uh, record from the ipsilateral side, and in fact, um, not not the data that I showed you here with the functional connectivity, but in another monkey. Uh, the contralateral side failed for some reason, the recordings failed, so we ended up using ipsilateral control um, for the BMI in that case. And it worked. Successfully. Successfully, yes. So we so used it. was just one animal? One animal, we, we, for each of the animals we did bilateral implants, just as a safety, just, a, just to make sure that something, if something went wrong, we still had another. Uh, so we, yes, yeah, so we did bilateral implants, one of our animals, the array, just failed miserably. Um, I don't know what it was. I think it was some, uh, make, some fabrication problem with the array. So then we ended up using the ipsilateral side for control. And it worked just fine. Right. So, so there's that direction um, yeah. that we thought in the, the focal brain lesion that the other, the other <clears throat> on the side might be playing a role in restoring the function. So, but that's in the injured, you know, I, it, in the injured system. Yeah. So it's after stroke, but you were saying these are healthy animals. These are healthy animals, yes. How about? Well, well except for amputation. How about just random areas of, you know, anterior frontal cortex that's. Yeah, right. Right, well, that, I, I think it probably could work in many different areas. Yes, I don't think it, I mean, people are using visual areas for BMI control too, uh, using EEGs over visual areas. Um, yeah, I, I bet you it would be, the only thing that, you know, we did a study uh, several years ago where we directly compared decoding of kinematics 
between several different areas, or at least not several, but just two areas, primary motor cortex and premotor areas. And we found that motor cortex significantly does better at decoding the detailed kinematics of, of the motion. So that's not to say that premotor wouldn't work. It's just if I had to choose, I would pick primary motor cortex. Um, yeah. Determine neural connectivity. Mm -hmm. Is there a um, advantage of doing it by the like fancy stepwise regression kind of way than simply doing a uh, cross pair cross choreograph? There are a particular reason that justify the use of that uh, stepwise regression. Well, we uh, we wanted to. Uh, if you just use correlational methods. Well, there are, two, there are two weaknesses with that. One is correlations itself don't, don't really assign direction. Uh, and I mean, I guess you could, you could look at the time lag. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the other reason is that that's only pairwise. Here, we're now taking the entire network. We're modeling the entire network and then saying, OK, now let me excise one neuron one, one neuron from the network, does that debilitate our ability to predict the response of the neuron? So it's a, it's, it goes beyond just pairwise. I mean, it's still pairwise. It's still pairwise. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just feel that method is pretty new. I haven't read that before, so I'm wondering. I, I think it's. Well, also, the other thing is we're, we're, we're not just correlating. I mean, we're, we're actually predicting. We're predicting responses based on past responses. Um, I guess, I mean, it is kind of a form of correlation. It's similar. But I think regression is the, the, the more, I think, more of legitimate way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, so when you're talking about the, the appropriate set, the last part, when, yes, so there was a time delay uh, between the, well, the, the, the commanded signal, um, let me think now, and actually, yeah, so, so, let me think now. Yeah, there was a delay of about 50 to 100 milliseconds, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. I think with the earlier <coughs> observation that you guys did, uh, where there was like a mirror neuron effect. Yes. And you don't. So what proportion of neurons you actually found that were responding to visual? Oh, I can show you that. I can't give you a number, but I can show you the data. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I have that. It's um, If you, if you don't mind, I mean, do, you have, do we have to leave? I can sh find it another. Um, I can't give you a proportion, but I can tell you there's, um, let me see, let me see if I can find it. That was in the motor cortex. This, we did it both in the motor cortex and in the dorsal premotor cortex. Maybe it's here. Observation have a role in the study no. of the pro proprio section that you you are doing. So, so I, the thing you have the monkey visualizing. So you see, it's possible that the real neuron effect is affecting. Oh, I see. Well, he's not. Um, well, so so in the case of the last experiment where we use proprioception, he. <laughs> We were comparing a case where he was 
moving the, deco uh, moving the cursor with his motor cortex without his arm moving versus a case when his arm was being passively moved. There was no vision of his arm. There was no vision of his arm. There was just vision of the cursor. Yes. So, right, right. It was blowing the mirror effect by showing the monkey the movement of the arm. By what? By showing the monkey the arm moving. The oh, movement. showing the arm. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You could do that. <laughs> um, right, right. Okay.